Now, please welcome CEO, the Travel Corporation, Brett Tolman, and Associate Editor, Skift, Hanna Sampson. Today we're talking about the state of package travel and, and why it matters. Um, but I want to start with a brief definition of, of what we're talking about because the Travel Corporation has so many different brands that touch on different parts of travel. And we're focusing on package travel, specifically packages that include an escort. Um, so how much of your company is in that sector? Sure. So just to put it in context, obviously, as Mr. Donald was talking about, there are far more important things in the world today than the future of package tours from what we heard last night on TV to the racial tensions in this country and so forth. So I certainly want to reiterate that that's far more important than some of the issues we're talking about. But with package travel, you know, some of it's really more about nomenclature than it is the experiences. So the type of holidays we provide are putting amazing, immersive, handcrafted experiences together where you go and meet locals and really get to understand and experience the destinations. Historically, that's been called a package tour or an escorted tour. Some people question what an escort is, but we have some of the greatest travel directors, tour directors, All trip perfectly managers, legal above ground escorted tours, yes. And so our challenge really is being better storytellers, as uh, Rafat said at the beginning this morning. And that's really we're focusing on improving our marketing and our sales so that people don't talk about package tours, but these amazing experiences where you can go and meet a local farmer or a winemaker and understand what life's like for them, what they do every day, how they make and get their products to market, have amazing dining experiences. No different what Airbnb talks about. So. And who's, I mean, who is actually taking a guided tour in 2016? What's your prime market? And how has that part of your business changed over the last several years? So we pretty much operate in English-speaking countries. So the US is our most important outbound market. And then we sell in amazing countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, England, and all Asian English-speaking countries and our travelers or really anyone. Um, our young brand, Kentucky, uh, serves customers 18 to 35. The average traveler is about 24 to 28, so graduating college students to young working professionals. And then our open age brands, Trafalgar, Insight, and even Uniworld River Cruises deal with family travelers to primarily couples, and those age demographics are 50 plus. And we believe these holidays are for anyone and everyone, no different to the great job that Carnival does. How have you seen that part of your business grow in the last 15 years? Is that a shrinking part of the overall, um, what you do at the Travel Corporation? And whatever that answer is, uh, tell me why you think that is. Sure. So I don't answer part of your question. We've certainly tried to innovate in the last decade so that what a package tour was in the 80s isn't what it is today. And Trafalgar and Insight, I think, have been amazing in their innovations. Uh, we'll take you and get to show you things, even if you live in the city, that uh, you didn't know were there. And that's by engaging some of the great local storytellers, who are our tour directors and travel directors, who get a lot of training, and uh, doing a lot more with, obviously, culinary experiences. Kentucky launched something called Munch using a Danish master chef who's gone out and ensured all the places that we go to really are doing very immersive local culinary experiences that young people are looking for. And we do the same with some of our other brands. And uh, some of that evolution is certainly working. What are, your, what are your big challenges? Because when I think about travel today, um, I think about the buzzwords that you hear all the time, which are authenticity and discovery. And that doesn't necessarily seem to meld with the idea of, oh, here's somebody showing me these things. Sure. Um, how do you work that? What's your challenge in trying to sell what you sell to people who want 
customization and authenticity and self-discovery. Right. So it is very crowded and it's very challenging, obviously, just as Mr. Donald was talking about, whether it's Carnival, ourselves, or any of us in the industry, we all kind of say the same things. We offer immersive experience. Our NPS scores are the best in the industry. And obviously it's very fragmented and there's amazing disintermediation. So the challenge for all of us is finding ways to engage with the customers from virtual reality to working with social influencers to try to find ways to cut through and engage the customer. We're very much channel agnostic, so we have and always will very much support the uh, travel trade. And that makes up about 80% of our business in terms of bookings, with the exception of Kentucky, which is about 50-50. And for us, it's just about finding more travelers who want to book with us and finding ways to cut through the clutter and the amazing uh, communications and marketing that's out there from those who work in the sharing economy to those who work within our space that are more of the legacy or traditional operators. And it's certainly not easy, but that's part of the fun and the challenge is finding ways to do it differently. And if you go to Trafalgar's website, for example, you'll see some of the amazing ways we're communicating to a video you're gonna show in a minute in Kentucky. And one thing we're very proud of, we invest heavily in delivering incredible value and quality. So 15 years ago with our uh, luxury hotel group, we embedded TripAdvisor right in the website so that people could learn directly without having to go to TripAdvisor what our hotel experiences are like. And a couple of years ago, we work, started working with a group called FIFO, who are based out of the UK, who are kind of the trip advisor for travel. And that's unedited, uncurated um, feedback from the customers. After a trip, FIFO will contact the customer directly and ask them to give feedback. And so we certainly believe that social media is the way to go. Uh, User-generated content is key. We've all read the statistics that individuals will obviously believe more what other travelers or guests have experienced and what their view of the, uh, the product, the quality, the value is. And so we've invested very heavily in ensuring that delivery is amazing. And in turn, then people can find out from other travelers rather than our own marketing how our experiences are like. And how do you enable travelers to feel like they have more power over the trip that they're going to take, even if they know there's going to be a guide? Um, maybe they feel a little let down because they're not doing the things that they are really passionate about because it's all packaged together. Um, how, do you, how do you give them that power to kind of sure. say a little bit more of what they want out of their trip? We've developed some great mobile tools so that as soon as someone's booked with us, we can send them an email, get them to register. And in that, we learn about all their personal interests, what their dietary uh, needs or expectations are, what type of sleeping arrangements they want from a double bed to uh, two twins or whatever it might be. And then that information is all fed through to our operations team. And we ensure that in advance, we are personalizing and customizing those trips to the extent we can. If someone's very interested in art, we'll find out what the local museums are on the trips we're going to, provide that information to them either in advance or when they arrive on the trip. We can certainly anticipate their needs on gluten-free, nut allergies, whatever it might be. So they're not having to ask for that. Capturing information such as passport details so that uh, every hotel you check into in Europe, you don't have to give that and it's seamless. You don't even have to check in. Our uh, travel directors give them the keys on, a, on arrival and their luggage is in the room in five minutes. So it's a wonderfully seamless experience and we're making it personalized as possible. One of the things we see, frankly, is that many people say they want to go and do their own thing, but when you are traveling in a country where uh, you know, there's foreign languages and other issues, sometimes you do kind of want a guiding hand to help you. We are a niche business, so we're not looking for millions of travelers, and we believe with the delivery that we're doing and developing these uh, mobile tools, we can personalize and anticipate these trips as best we can. It's equally important, obviously, with emergencies in the world that we live in today with unexpected issues and events that it's important to be able to get hold of your customers. We have an amazing uh, emergency crisis response team that work around the clock to track people down, make sure they're safe and helping them in any way because obviously today that is uh, a part of international travel. 
When you look at Americans, obviously there's certainly not enough of us traveling overseas. And it's amazing some of the discussions you hear about people who don't want to go to Paris because they're more concerned about a terrorist event than they are obviously what can happen in, I live in LA and there's more shootings a week in uh, LA than happen internationally with terrorism events and so forth. So that's as much of the challenge as inspiring or convincing people that it's as amazing and one can't use the word safe, but there's no reason you shouldn't be traveling overseas and sharing you know, your experiences and going out and seeing the world. Do you see anyone, or do you see any indication that maybe people will find more of a comfort element in the idea of having a guide um, or an escorted tour, and so maybe that's an option they're a little more um, okay with right now? It's not really something you wanna market directly like that, but do you see any patterns that tell you anyone's moving in that direction? Well, you know, you're talking about millions and billions of people out there, so everyone's different, and we certainly don't like to generalize. There are many people who you know, love Airbnb. I certainly wouldn't, it's not my thing, but that's not to say it's wrong or it's different. And we like to focus very much on our niches. <clears throat> and you know, if you live in the US and you wanna go see the national parks, it's very easy to get in a car and just go do it. <clears throat> I was just on one of our trips with Trafalgar going through one of our national parks explorers and we had an amazing variety of people, a couple from Pennsylvania who had never been on a holiday before. And it was amazing meeting them. They'd never been to Europe, so I got the opportunity to offer them a trip to anywhere they wanted to go. And it's just wonderful when you get out there and travel with people, is to see how diverse their interests are. And it is wonderful when you can travel with someone like one of our trip managers. And they study geology, they know so much history about the destination, the experiences. And certainly some people can look it up on mobile, or obviously take a trip, uh, a book with them to read about it, but it's so seamless and I think more insightful sometimes to be able to do it with someone who really knows the area. Do you think there's a negative stereotype associated with guided tour, escorted tour? Maybe it's a throwback, maybe people just think that, oh, it's just, you know, it's just some tourists who do that and I don't want to be a tourist, I want to be a traveler. Do you think that exists? Do you see evidence of that? And, and what do you do to combat that? Again, I think it's being the best storyteller that you can and trying to break down some of those perceptions. And that's the challenge on us, obviously. Perceptions are reality. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that for us is the biggest opportunity is trying to explain and highlight how different the experiences that we offer today are to either what a preconceived conception is or what they understood, a guided holiday or guided vacation escorted journey, as we call them today, rather than a package tour, can be. We talked about buzzwords, and millennial is another one of those buzzwords. We can't talk about them without bringing up their desire for immersive, real, meaningful vacations. Um, I'm gonna throw craft beer in there also, because that always seems to go in the mix. Oh, um, how do you, how do you, IPAs, how do you sell package tours to that group of people, um, and we're gonna talk about it, but first we have a video to roll. on, it's pretty cool, no? <laughs> I didn't see a tour guide in that video at all. Right. Um, tell me a little bit about what you're doing there and how that is feeding into your approach to millennials and also how is that working for you? So it's working incredibly well. That's our young brand, Kentucky, that I mentioned earlier. And every year we launch our next year's program around this time of the year. And as part of that, we come up with a new way to launch the program. So last year, we worked with a fairly well-known social influencer, I'm sure many of you know, called Devon Supertramp, who's done some amazing work on YouTube. 
and we did a video with him. There was a very small instant of that at the beginning where it was making someone's dream come true. He always wanted to do cliff jumping in Capri. So we took him there, and this very cool video was done that was then posted on YouTube. We got about six million views out of it. And this year we decided to change it up, and we identified eight different social influencers. We have a total following of about 16.2 million followers. And uh, we've worked with them to come up with different contests. There's one against another, so Devon Supertramp's involved, Joe Sugg, Casper Lee, who came out with the movie recently, another ex-South African like myself. And each of them will go to a destination with us and get to do and meet some of the local people that turn them on. So Casper cruises around Spain trying to learn the language, how to engage with people and so forth. This other guy from Australia gets to go and play soccer with some kids in Italy. And it's trying to show people through the eyes of these influencers, what you can do in these destinations and how you can travel with, as we say, no regrets. And in turn, by following those uh, influencers, they get to learn about our brand and our experiences and destinations without the brand obviously talking about it. We're about halfway through this contest. There's uh, two social influencers go up against each other and then people get to vote. We have different gifts built into the video so that it's more engaging. And then at the end, whoever wins from each of the four contests of the eight uh, influencers get to choose someone who they then give a Kentucky trip to. Uh, you said it's working well. Uh, so how is that translating into how you're seeing Kentucky business performance? So compared to our open age brands, Kentucky is doing remarkably well in these unsettled times. Unlike uh, Carnival and ocean cruising, we cannot move Europe in terms of where we go. So it's a real challenge for us. But by doing the kind of engaging work that we're doing with Kentucky, our sales are up substantially, whereas being honest, our brands like Trafalgar Insight, River Cruising in Europe, they're quite challenged right now. As I said earlier, people don't want to visit France, unfortunately. I spent a month there in July, and it's amazing. And even though you've got Red Beret paratroopers are on the streets, and no different to the TSA, I mean, it gives you a little sense of security, but you're as safe or unlikely to have an event there as you are obviously having a car accident here or an, a mishap in a hospital. So you have Kentucky that's doing well. You have 20-something you know, other brands, including River, Cruise, uh, Hotel, Safari, Backpacking, all of these different pockets of travel. How can you take learnings from any of those segments and apply them to the parts that aren't doing as well? Sure. Um, are you constantly learning from different parts of your business to help the other parts? And how do, how do you make that work? You know, being a, a human being, I think we can and should be learning every day. So that's what I love about Skift is there is just so much you can learn as to what's happening in the world in this space, whether it's travel and digital. And that's why I have such admiration for Rafat and Jason and what they're doing. And equally, obviously, one can learn within your business all the time. One of my colleagues is here, Dan Christian, who heads up our digital team globally. And he has a weekly call with all of our digital people from every brand and every market, sharing some of the things that are working. What should we be doing differently? We're rolling out a new search tool across all of our websites using a standard that one of the brands found. Um, the new leader of Kentucky and our CTO come from Groupon. So again, we're trying to learn and adapt from them of how do you try to get a, an online booking from way too many clicks to three or four clicks. Obviously, you can't do it with one click. In travel, we certainly convinced them of that. And so we're open to learning and adapting every day. We live in such crazy, fast-changing times that I think we have to always be very agile and adaptive and I'm certainly a big believer in learning and listening from everyone. My father brought me up to look, listen, and learn. And as Yogi Bear always said, it's amazing how much you can learn when you shut your mouth, sit down, and open your ears. <laughs> You've had um, a certain set of competitors for a long time. Um, but these days, it's not just the Globus or Abercrombie and Kent out there. There's Uber that does whatever they're doing all the time, and, um, and apps, and startups, and 
you know, everybody's trying to get a piece of the travel business, as you know. How do you adapt to try to compete with the disruptors and kind of foresee what's, what you don't even know about yet? So, it's not easy. Um, again, our chairman has a very strong view, and that is don't focus on the competition and only focus on yourself. You cannot affect or change what your competition does. And every minute you're spending worrying about or thinking about what the competition's doing is time you're not focused on your own business. So we try to be as disciplined as possible to just do what we do well. And if we do that and we deliver great experiences and value for our customers, they'll come back and through UGC, they'll share that with other travelers. And that's what we try to do. We're a third generation company and uh, we're debt free. And that's a wonderful thing. And as a family run business, you know, the biggest responsibility is making sure I don't screw it up so that there is a fourth generation out there. And so it is very difficult in terms of every day there's something new out there. But uh, as I say, if we just stick to making sure that we're doing a great job and our com company is doing what it should do and we're taking care of our customers, that I think is the key to any business. Just take care of your customers, they'll come back and they'll tell other people about it. But if you're always looking outside and what someone else is doing, you're not focusing enough time on taking care of your customers and frankly your own people because it is very competitive out there and people are always out looking for better talent. And I do believe the company that has the best team wins, whether you're in professional sports or in any company. And so it's just as important to be engaging your people, make sure they've got great career paths, you're recognizing them, rewarding them, and so forth. So, as I say, I am aware of what's going on out there, and I don't want to imply we're not, but equally importantly, we try to stay very focused on what we do. We have a couple of minutes for questions, so if anyone, um, if anyone does have a question, there's microphones. Rafat is standing <laughs> there with a mic. I don't know if he's going to hold it for anyone. Hold on. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. do, you, do you have a question? I do, I do. Oh, okay. Rafat um, Ali with a question. Well, you had my name, so I'm here. Uh, thank you, Brett. So, um, question. You and I have talked a bunch about uh, what it would take for OTAs to start selling the tour packages. Right. I know you've been thinking about it quite deeply. You and I have talked at length about it. Um, what are the OTAs missing so far? Um, Dara is here, I think, like an hour after you. Um, he's probably in the green room for now, for all I know. Um, what should he know that he doesn't already know why should he sell your tours or tours in general or booking.com or Priceline and others? Sure. And why do you care in the first place about them selling it? Sure. So the AT OTAs are a remarkable slice of the pie, obviously, and we're not there today. So as I said earlier, we're channel agnostic and we want every possible traveler. We have a huge infrastructure and a lot of mouths to feed and families to look after. So to ensure our business remains relevant and sustainable for the future, we've got to keep growing. And not being on those OTA sites is a missed opportunity for us. So the challenge for the OTAs is they've got a huge pipeline of IT projects, obviously, and being we're a relative niche business, there's always bigger priorities, especially engaging with the uh, big cruise companies. So I just got to continue to be a squeaky wheel with Dara, and he does listen, and he's promise that we're going to get there. And we've got to make sure our technology is good enough and our API is so it's pretty easy to consume our live dates, rates, and other rich content. So once we can get to that point where the pipeline's got just a little bit of time to slip us in, we'll get there. But don't you have to be careful what you wish for in terms of owning the customer? Because you own everything about the customer from the start to the finish. And OTAs would love to not give you any of that data. So. Is that something that you're worried about in terms of are you willing to let go? Absolutely. I hate disagreeing with you and I almost don't on anything, but I don't think anyone owns a customer. Every customer is an individual. We don't own the customer. A travel agent doesn't own the customer. No one does. And that individual in today's world has so many ways to do research, to book, and choices on where to go, when to go, and with who. And so I think the challenge and opportunity for all of us is how you try to connect with people. I'll let that Kentucky example. And then it's up to them how they want to choose. I don't mind if they book through an OTA. 
as long as they don't want to charge us a 30% commission or something like that, <laughs> and or if they book directly. We just want more travelers to come with us. Well, I think some of the hoteliers will tell you lots of stories. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, questions, I think we can, you can move up to one of the microphones up there, left and right, and ask any questions that you have. <coughs> in case you want to continue. Yeah, if, everyone, if anyone has one, just feel free to get up and make your way to the mic. Um, Brett, if, while they're making their way or while they're I think not. you'll have to come up to the microphone, sorry. Just because for uh, ease of, if you want to line up. Okay, I think, yeah, okay, Hello. go ahead. Hi, <laughs> what would you tell, um, I guess, the small guys, um, people who are selling package travel or experiences in emerging markets, let's say, because um, they obviously can't compete with companies like yours, but what would you tell them? As I said earlier, just make sure you're doing a great job. And if you got one customer today, take amazing care of them, have a great time, they'll come back with you and they'll tell someone, and then you've got two travelers and three travelers. We started with Trafalgar in this country in 1975, and we did 1,000 people. And today it's significantly more. And that was just about taking care of people and being great at relationships, whether it's through your travel trade partners who book you. But I can assure you, I stay up at night worrying about companies like you as well. So never think you're too small. But just really take care of your people, the people who operate for you, and your customers. Because one will grow to two, two will grow to four. And keep reading Skift, because you'll learn how to do it more effectively and efficiently. I truly believe that. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else has a question, please feel free. Um, the title of this conversation is The State of Package Travel and Why It Matters. So why, why does it matter? Why does it matter if um, everyone just decides to go off and be their own sure. app-driven tour guide and, and not take an escorted vacation? I think it matters because having been on many of these trips, they are amazing experiences and you get to learn more, you get to leave the driving, the parking, all of the experiences up to us to take care of that for you. Once you've made that decision and you've booked, we take care of everything else. And again, it's not for everyone. People want to go backpacking, hiking, do it themselves. That's fantastic. But if you are looking for a different experience, and to just sit back and have a very immersive, relaxed experience. And that's some of the adaptation we've done as well. Later starts in the morning. We're going to be launching for 2018 some new youth river cruising in Europe with Uniworld. And that's going to be a totally different experience based on what young people want to do, staying in the cities later at night, obviously waking up later in the morning and so <laughs> forth. And so it is adapting these experiences for a certain portion of the people. So I think it does matter. I've taken my kids on a lot of these trips and they've loved them. And they always say, when are we going back to Trafalgar? When are we going back and river cruising with Uniworld? And our kids, I'm very fortunate to say, are uh, very indulged and have done a lot of different experiences. So I see it that it's you know, not just speaking with too much pride or a uh, tinted lens. And it certainly matters to us because it's a core part of our business. And to be sustainable for the next generation, I think it's important. And we certainly leave a lot in the destinations as well. I know Rafat's going to talk about that later. And I mean, whether it's the hotels and the employees there who you know, work and live in those destinations to the individuals that we support in the excursions, the restaurants, and so forth. I mean, 80% of what we sell stays in the destination with those locals. So it's very important from a sustainability standpoint. We have a nonprofit foundation called Treadright that we put some of our profits in. And the focus of that is very much supporting locals. So we work with the uh, Aid for Artisans, which Hillary Clinton and the Aspen Foundation started, which looks to bring women in particular into the workforce by teaching them skills. And so we work with weaving groups in Peru and Perugia in Italy. We work with this um, local uh, indigenous tribe in Canada who make muckluck shoes. And we take people to those very authentic experiences, get to meet these individuals, and hopefully buy some of uh, the items that they make. But they're very authentic, and they really are remarkable in terms of that opportunity to support some of those people as well. Um, 
we just have a couple of seconds left, but real quick, can you tell me what your, um, what your biggest growth opportunity is right now that you're really going after hard? Sure. So I think the OTAs is a big opportunity for us and trying to get more Americans to travel. You know, the uh, number of people who hold a passport is relatively small. I think that'll change in the next couple of years as the FAA changes the requirements for IDs with flights. And it's an amazing world out there. And I think more and more Americans should have the desire and the interest to go and do it. So we're certainly very focused on how we can grow more travel, both outbound from here, as well as more people seeing this beautiful, amazing country domestically as well. And I think the national parks have done a fantastic job promoting the 100-year uh, anniversary. All right, Brad Tolman, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Hannah.